Welcome to Longmont Voices and Vision, a project of Longmont Public Media. In the midst of the darkest period in our lives, when we're bombarded 24 hours a day with news of the coronavirus and the human and economic carnage it's causing in our society, we're challenged to cope with our fears and anxieties while remaining hopeful about what lies on the other side of this crisis. This project presents an opportunity for Longmont residents to share with others how they're adjusting to new realities of social distancing and the kind of future they hope to experience on the other side of the crisis. I'm Tim Waters, host of these conversations and a Longmont public media volunteer. In this series, I'll be asking Longmont residents, many of them your friends and neighbors, three questions. What are you doing to get through this crisis? Even though we cannot be together right now, how are we staying connected to friends and families? And what's the future you are hoping to see and experience on the other side of this crisis? I hope you'll stay with this series and enjoy listening to your friends and neighbors and learn from them how they're getting through and what they're looking forward to in a new reality on the other side. Michelle Waite, thank you so much for your willingness to contribute to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. Each of these interviews uh, have, have started with people telling us a little bit about themselves. So uh, I'm going to ask you to do that. But, but as you do it, I want to also thank you for the extraordinary contributions you make to Longmont based on what you do every day with your life. So um, as you talk about who you are, I think it'll be important for people to know what you do and how you serve uh, this, this community. So take it away. All right, so my name is Michelle Waite. I have been a part of the Longmont community since 1981 when I was hired by the city of Longmont to work for Longmont Senior Center and Longmont Senior Services. And I have been in this uh, wonderful place uh, ever since. So I've been at Senior Services for 38 years. I have a husband and a couple of grown kids and um, lots of community here and lots of customers over the years and fabulous colleagues. Well, most people, um, when they talk about the Senior Center, uh, know it has been differentiated as one of the most extraordinary <laughs> resources, not just in this community, in any community. So I want to oh, say, yeah. It's great to hear. Yeah. Um, well, it's just the truth. So, you know, I'm going to ask you three questions. The first of these three questions is, in a time of... Um, well, we have more kind of unknowns than we have knowns and the and the how unsettling that is the fear that goes along with that people are having to find ways to get themselves through this ex extraordinary period of time that none of us have ever experienced before how are you doing that well working is really um super important for that it keeps me focused it gives me a purpose uh, with all of the conversation about older adults being so vulnerable with this particular pandemic, uh, more so than others, um, it makes it really extremely important that myself and my team are thinking and responding to what that has presented us. What are we doing in terms of information services? How are we positioned to make it better for the older adults in Longmont? and uh, looking for more ways, what, what's our role, what's our purpose. And so that's absolutely been critical for keep getting me through. Um, and probably even more important has been my faith. So that has always been a still point in a crazy world. And in this world in particular, it, it gives me a frame of reference to both really appreciate the blessings that are happening, and they are, um, and dealing with the loss um, and challenges. So that faith piece, uh, I, I attended virtual services, which I got to tell you, I'm not super good at, uh, um, may, but I am trying to find daily, regular ways to, to stay connected and use the, all of those faith pieces to support me and keep me hopeful. Well, the last part of that, answer the connections uh segue right into my next question and that is in a time where we can't be together physically right. uh because of our the, the the orders of stay at home now safe at home and, and social distancing 
how are you staying connected with family and friends? So that's really been about um, mostly texting uh, and a lot of phone calls, just those daily, regular, ongoing checks, reaching out to people that I haven't uh, spent time with recently and making sure folks are okay. I found myself writing lengthier notes in birthday cards as I, anniversary cards, as I, you know, really trying to make sure people knew what I thought about them or how I felt. Um, my mom, who is in her 90s, uh, lives uh, in the area, and I have definitely upped uh, phone calls with her as her circle becomes more limiting. That, that's more important uh, to have more time with her. And we have driveway time. So I go over and if the weather allows, we, we spend time in the driveway. So uh, we were able to uh, be together for the Thunderbirds. Uh, I, I left before they flew right over her house, but she had a fabulous experience. So that, um, that texting and that, you know, just trying to find appropriate safe ways to be together is, is really important. I would say in addition to family and friends, uh, what we sometimes call our work family is also really important. And with half of us teleworking, um, those connections are also been very important. And so my, uh, my team has, we're, we're doing the regular stuff, the, the WebEx meetings and the Zoom meetings and doing our business, but uh, they started a texting check-in. And um, one of my coworkers said, I've learned more about my teammates through this experience uh, because they're doing it from home like here's the flower that popped through the garden today or this is what my kids are up to and and so that has been just so uplifting just so my family my friends and my work team um, all of those connections it's really about making sure you're making them happen well that those are all sounds like uh, weren't part of the normal <laughs> for you all before this pandemic. And uh, the last question is really uh, based on the presumption that whatever is normal in the future, life is gonna be different than it was before the pandemic. And uh, we don't know what that's gonna look like or what that's gonna be, but we have a chance to imagine what we'd like to see. So for you, what would be your preferred future that you'd, that you'd like to see as the new normal and what are you willing to help create? So I think what, um, I am hopeful for the understanding and the commitment to the greater good that is happening. So I think we saw incredible giving during the flood um, and this crisis has touched all of us where the flood had some pockets that were not as touched. Um, and so I am hopeful that the understanding of the greater good and the desire to embrace it plays out more and more and more where we church, where we neighbor, where we work, how we vote, how we are engaged in our uh, communities, that that greater good we just continue to hold out there as more important than um, the individual independent spirit uh, that perhaps we have become uh, in some ways unfortunately known for. Um, so the greater good piece, I'm hopeful for that. I ran into a person in the grocery store who said to me uh, from six feet away, thank you very much for wearing your mask for me. And then she said, and I'm wearing my mask for you. And it was like, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, you know, you just got to love that, uh, that recognition of that. So I'm very appreciative of that. Um, I think the, another hope for the future is I think a lot of us have had lots more time to spend time with ourselves. And so how we have a future that allows for that personal reflection time um, and at the same time really recognizing how much I miss my customers, how much I miss that human interaction, those hugs. And so I think in the future, we will be far more attentive to both that, both that personal moments as well as the importance of being connected with other people. I think we're all taking advantage of the virtual world like this. Um, and I think we're all gonna wanna get back to that human to human contact too, and being very appreciative of, of those opportunities. 
there are so many real heroes in this um, in this experience, and a lot of them we know, right? Our doctors, our nurses, our fire and paramedics, and all of those folks. I think we've come to understand that there are those unknown heroes. Um, our grocery clerks, the volunteers who are delivering meals and groceries, the people making masks. Um, this week, I got a note from uh, someone who was talking to me about an 89-year-old woman who was making masks and needed a place to give them away to. And all of those quiet, silent, more silent heroes. So I think uh, with great adversity, there's also great opportunity for people to just shine. And so I don't want to forget their courage. I don't want to forget their generosity, their strength. and. Uh, so my hope for future is we do a better um, and more about recognizing both those valiant folks who are so much more known as well as those who maybe are a little bit on the quieter side. And I would say lastly, um, a big hope I have, and it comes from an aging uh, perspective, is that we will more fully embrace um, what aging in America looks like um, and really call upon and call out and support the folks who are doing personal and care in our long-term care settings, in our assisted living settings, in our senior communities, and in individual homes. Because um, you know, 80 plus percent of the care given to older adults is given by family members and friends. And so how do we more fully recognize that and support that and um, and just make that the best care we can provide to the older adults and our families, our neighborhoods, our communities, and our nation. So that's, uh, that's a big hope. Um, and I hope that um, Longmont Senior Services and that we're a part of that, a part of making that reality happen. And I'm excited for what that could be um, for sure, so. Michelle, you've described uh, or shared your aspirations for a future that's worth pursuing. I hope so. <laughs> so uh, I want to say thanks again for your contribution to this project and, and uh, deep, deep appreciation for all that you do every day. Well, thank you, Tim, for making this happen. And well, public media, too. Well, uh, when, we, when we can resume what some semblance of normal is and we're in the same room together, we'll high five or maybe even hug one another. Yeah, I like that. I All like right. that. All right. All right. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. Take care, Take care of your you family. You too. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. David Bell, thank you for your willingness to contribute to the Longmont Voices and Vision Project. We appreciate your willingness to contribute to this project, and as we'll learn just in a, in a couple of seconds about who you are and what you do, thank you as well for your, your contributions to the city. So to get started, tell us a little bit about who David Bell is. Well, first, thank you for inviting me, and that let me have the chance to kind of share my story about what we're going through right now. Um, again, David Bell, I'm the Director of Parks and Natural Resources for the City of Longmont. I've been doing that for four years now, and prior to that, though, um, I was with Boulder County Parks and Open Space for about 19 years. So I set that stage with the fact that I've been in this area for quite a while, working in this field, um, providing for the protection of natural resources, but also for trying to find that balance, how we get people out to use and enjoy our natural resources as well. So um, it's been a passion of mine since as long as I can remember, and I've been very fortunate. I've been you know, pushing almost 25 years now working in this field of um, trying to get people to recognize and understand the importance of our natural environment, um, protecting that environment, but again, um, very much of the mindset that people have to be able to touch, use, and enjoy those things before they can feel like they have a responsibility to take care of and, and nurture those areas too. So I think um, Longmont has done a great job of trying to make that interface where people can get out and touch, play with, and engage in our natural areas, but also then a great open space program that allows people to you know, areas where nature takes the forefront and people become the observers in those situations. So I think we have great opportunities here. It's something that um, it's been important to me in public service for um, a long time. And um, beyond my professional side, I uh, have a wife and two daughters, which makes this a definitely interesting time as you try to talk to and explain to them about something that's very new and unique for them. 
Um, senior in high school, which is, I think, you know, as an educator is a very challenging time as we, we all try to be aware of that everyone has a lot going on in their lives. We have loss of life, we have people on our front lines, but to high school senior, we have all these rites of passage that are being sort of eliminated. It's, it's a hard conversation, even though she's done a great job of trying to keep it in perspective. We have some challenging days there. Um, I have another daughter down at CU Boulder who has um, got herself isolated with her apartment with her engineering roommates and they're still continuing with classes. And she is volunteering down at the homeless shelter down in Boulder for people who have no place to um, self quarantine when you don't have a home. So um, they've done a good job of providing resources for the individuals volunteering there as well. So and at that length, my girls, my wife is a nurse. So she is working in the hospital environment every day. And um, fortunately, they're all staying healthy and feel like they're being productive. And I would say for me, again, just feel very fortunate that I have the job that I have, where again, as you compare it to those frontline workers, um, the healthcare professionals, I feel very, you know, much in the background with what they're doing. But again, I'll tell you, as I get out in our parks and I really see what it really means to people to be outside when they're quarantined, but can get out in the parks. I will tell you in the 25 years of doing this, um, the eye contact, the waving, the engagement for people that are doing self um, distancing, but just that knowing that we're out there, we're together and we're sharing this space has been really, I think some of the most um, enjoyable times I've seen in our parks. And David, I've, I've uh, tried to make very few editorial comments during these interviews, but I will say in this case, uh, the Bell family obviously is making huge contributions <laughs> from uh, from all sectors of the family. And um, if there was ever a moment or a period where people would appreciate what we've done with parks and open space, this would be it, um, this period of time. So thanks for all of that. Uh, three questions you know I'm going to ask. And the first is this. <clears throat> In this time of, of uh, uh, unprecedented physical separation and social distancing, what a situation we've never experienced before. What are you doing to get yourself uh, through this experience? I, I think there's a couple pieces to that. I, I think, you know, that social distancing has, has been really a, a challenge for a, a lot of people, um, especially in the work environment, how we continue to do our job. So I think there's, I'm going to kind of break this into um, the, the personal, professional, and family piece. So um, the work area has been a challenge as I talked about. I think we, we mentioned the importance of people who are out there cleaning our parks, making sure the trash is empty, making sure that um, the people who don't have homes are trying to camp in our parks or getting the information they need to be in a place that's safe. So those frontline workers are still out there on a daily basis, trying to maintain distance, doing jobs that um, provide service for the city. So um, that is a challenge and how we do the, the, that that part of the job. I have other professional staff that is at home working. And uh, for some, it may seem like that's an easier place to be, but I feel for them as well because they get off work at the end of the day and they're still at work. They do, there really isn't that, that sort of physical and mental break, I think, for my staff at home where they're trying to manage kids, they're trying to manage their, their work and um, just trying to recognize that they're doing their best under the circumstances we have. I get staff apologizing on a daily basis, say, I just don't feel like I'm being as productive as I could be as I'm trying to care for kids and do meals and, and do our work. So um, if you're on the front line doing it, if you're at home doing it, it has been a challenge. And for me, again, I, I'm in that spot where I feel fortunate. I can come into the office, I can engage with my staff, we're doing the social distancing, and um, I think it's working fairly well. Um, on the personal side, I would say there's been some very interesting things that come out of it. We've had our first Zoom birthday party probably three weeks ago. And when we did that, we realized it's really kind of nice to reconnect um, with people that maybe you just got a Christmas card from. Um, and now we're getting together at cocktail hours after work and um, reconnecting with people and family that we really didn't see except for a family reunion or something on a more regular basis. So I would say um, that's helped on the personal side. And then with my wife and daughters, you know, the board games and the things that we do around our, our property with, you know, gardening and animals and stuff have, has really just kind of enriched that a little bit. And um, so it's the, kind of the personal, professional, and then, um, yeah, the family side. So we had the, the friends that we can kind of keep in contact with and then but the family side, it really is. I think we really have spent some really good time um, 
trying to let off steam in a very confined area and recognizing everyone's challenges and uh, again buying board games buying puzzles watching movies talking about movies talking about um how we get through this and um what it means for them down the road especially have again um, young girls that are looking at um, their futures and jobs and, and college um, it really has led to some really engaging conversations you uh, may have already answered the second of my three questions uh, and that is in a time when we can't physically be together how do we stay connected so you've answered part of that but would you, is there anything to add how are you staying connected to family and friends through this time of, of isolation I do really think that we are fortunate in the technology that we have right now. I, I think it's not it's not the same um, as being physically in a room with someone and breaking bread and sharing a, a drink with someone, but I, I do think the ability to really reach out and connect and um, have these conversations that maybe the art of writing has dropped off and text and emails become more common, but um, being able to do a Zoom meeting or doing a Teams meeting with um, people you haven't seen in a while has been a good way of doing it and again I say that other piece is um sharing books sharing movies um and then having those those conversations about it and a piece that I, I kind of dropped in that first piece that we threw me off because I think you use something that um I've had a little bit of challenge with myself and people say this is unprecedented it's unprecedented for us but I do a lot of history reading if it's U.S. history if it's ancient Greek and Roman history I'm um, really not unprecedented at all it's the fact that um we probably could, probably should have been a bit more prepared by reading history and knowing that um, these events happen and nature throws things at us all the time and um, we kind of forget we get we get a little soft and we forget that we are still vulnerable to what nature has out there so for me going back and and reading reminding myself that if it's the greeks or the romans or our founding fathers with smallpox malaria, they went through isolation. They went through leaving DC and coming back and having a third of the population gone because of um, those, those diseases that they didn't really understand. So I think a lot of shared sort of background for me on the fact that people have gone through this before. Um, they have come out of it. And for me, one of my goals is not how do we get back to normal, but how do we come up better than when we went into it? So. Um, that, that's a piece that I really try using. And I know sometimes it can sound like it trivializes what we're going through, but it helps me a lot to know through that if it's Mark Aurelius or George Washington, that they, they suffered losses through these pandemics that, uh, that we uh, kind of lose track of over time. Well, I should have probably qualified unprecedented. It's unprecedented for, for me, <laughs> you know, but you're right, not in human history. So yep. uh, you, you've, already, you've already segued into my third question, and that is, uh, the, the, assuming uh, that life on the other side, whatever the new normal becomes, is going to be different than what, what life was like before the pandemic. Uh, what, and, 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 and we can look at kind of a, a dark future, right, that uh, the, kind of the worst fears. We also have a chance to help create what the new normal is. So for you, what's a preferred future? What would you like to see and experience and help create when we come out of this social distancing on the other side of this pandemic? I think, again, looking back historically, you can come out of this in an area that is dark. I, I do, do want to touch on that because it was conversations I've had with my daughters and stuff too. And, and um, again, we live in a very a family that is very tied to nature. We love the outdoors, but I think we're all technophiles too. We recognize how important technology is. I think my girls see a loss of opportunity. If this is bad enough, do we step our, do we go backwards? Is, is this the, um, the dark ages after, you know, you have a, a plague in the past where you lose some of the best minds and you lose some of those things that um, opportunities for college and education. So is there a chance we could slip backwards because we've, we've lost some time? Um, and I think it's something we need to think about. Um, but for me, I, I do hope that in this unprecedented time for us, we start really looking at some of the challenges we faced. And if it are the, those frontline workers, how do we as a society recognize people that really carry a lot of weight in a way that maybe our economic system doesn't really recognize and appreciate now? So maybe this is a chance to recognize who really are those people that we need to do a better job of recognizing in our society. And it's not just because of the dollars they make because of the work that they do. Um, the other piece I would say is um, 
this recognize how we support. I think people really work reaching out to support people, help people and get the people through this. But I do that on a daily basis because you never know what is um, unprecedented for day could be something tomorrow that is just for an individual unprecedented. And again, I, I didn't share with you my background. I was a medic in the Air Force. And um, when you walk into a room with a young patient that has terminal cancer, that is unprecedented for that family. And that will continue. And if we can remember that these events are gonna be happening to individuals as we move forward, how do we do a better job making sure they're supporting people through these unprecedented pieces through people's lives, whatever they may be. So I hope that it comes out that we not only come through this, we come out in a way that we help to reduce suffering for all those around us. So those people that are on the lower end of the economic ladder, those people going through um, health issues, um, mental or physical, and that we can do a better job supporting them through our economic programs, our social programs, and we start to recognize what really is important in, in all of this. David Bell, well said, and uh, thank you again for lending your voice and your vision to the Longmont Voices and Vision Project. Take welcome. care of yourself, stay safe and healthy, and take care of your family. Thank you very much, appreciate it.